Well, hello again. It's me, Robert Johnston, and I've been away from my YouTube channel for a little while, but I was uh, on Twitter this morning and I saw a tweet from Jerry Ordway of Superman fame and Justice Society fame and pretty much industry fame, comic book artist. And he mentioned something about this article from the New York Times. Uh, Russ Heath, he just died, I guess, on August 23rd. Uh, let's read the article a little bit. If my mouse will work. All right. Russ Heath, whose comics caught Lichtenstein's eye, dies at 91. Look at that studio. He looks like a well, well accomplished man right there. Um, confident. Look at that work. True creative. I bet you. Um, I'm not really familiar too much with him, but I think I'm going to look into some of his artwork. I mean, I know of certain things. Um, so let's get into the article. So this is a 1998 photo. Of, of him, of Russ Heath. Article is by Neil Genslinger or Genslinger or Gunslinger. This was written uh, yesterday. Today's Friday, August 31st. And this was written yesterday. Russ Heath, a prolific comic book artist who was known viscerally I'm sorry, who was known for viscerally illustrated combat stories and for either inspiring or being outright copied by the pop artist Roy Lichtenstein. Mm, I don't want to learn more about him at the moment. Maybe I'll check, I'll read that later. But if he's copying Russ, then that's, that's a no-no. That's a bad thing. Depending on whom you ask. Also, it's not a verified... Um, story? I don't know. He died August 23rd in Long Beach, California. He was 91. The cause was cancer. His daughter Sharon Heath Herzl said. Please forgive me. I'm a little bit slow this morning. Uh, I have the day off from work. So I thought I'd do something today. This is it. So I got my coffee. I had my breakfast. And now I'm just chilling. Uh, hopefully I don't sound too boring this morning. Anyway. Mr. Heath was a versatile artist who began his career shortly after World War II and was still drawing into this century. Having worked on series for comics publishers like DC and EC and for Playboy and National Lampoon. You know, National Lampoon uh, sort of was okay for me, but I wasn't—I didn't really consider it uh, comics. You know that I like to read them, but I did catch a movie recently on Netflix starring that guy who was on that show on Fox called The Last Man on Earth. He was also on SNL, and I think he played. Uh, a MacGyver um, spoof movie, which I saw. Yes, I'm a nerd, but I forget the guy's name. But anyway, this National Lampoon movie on Netflix, it was about the rise of the of the magazine. And, um, you know, it was a pretty good flick. Uh, you should give it a try. It's on Netflix. Just Google uh, National Lampoon Netflix and maybe that guy's name um, on the last man on earth um, series and you'll find it um, anyway back on to the article although his work included fantasy he was especially known for his drawings of tanks planes soldiers and other real life subjects he bought helmets and uniforms from army surplus stores to use as references and sometimes built models before drawing a piece of machinery 
And then the New York Times tried to sell me for a dollar a week to see, let's see my options. No, thank you. This whole thing is clickable uh, it's because it's an advertisement. Um, I don't know how I feel about paying for website access just yet. I mean, I'm sure it's, I'm sure we're all going to have to deal with this. This eventually, it's going to be, they're going to like tell us nothing until we pay them. But we'll see. We'll see. Uh oh, artwork. Russ may have been the best realist ever in comic books. The comic book writer and historian Mark Vanier, oh, I know who him, who that is. He wrote a lot of Phantom, the Phantom comics by DC that I really, really loved, and I still own. Pretty good. When he drew monsters and space aliens, they were fine, but when he drew the real world, he was so accurate. That was scary. Other artists, Mr. Evanier said, even used his renderings of tanks and airplanes for reference instead of photographs. Wow. He had it like that. Look at that. I love these old covers. You know, it makes you just, this is what comics is all about. The fantasy and the horror and the the terror and the thing in the mirror, you know, and the, it's a it's a a lizard creature, and then you got the skull with the candle on the top, and uh oh, left column, little snapshots. Yep, love that stuff. <clears throat> this is a Mister Heath's cover for a 1951 issue of Marvel Tales. Though he was best known for his war illustrations, his work was also seen in Drew Suspense, Mystery, Romance, and even Superhero Comics. Hmm. Well, let's get rid of that. Subscribe. Oh no, what is that trending bar? Somebody stop him. How much hotter is your hometown today? I don't know. All right. A different kind, aha, goodbye. A different kind of artist also uses Mr. Heath's drawings for reference. Lichtenstein, whose pop art paintings in the early 1960s reproduced and altered images from comic books and advertisements. Some were by Mr. Heath, whose influence can be seen in the Lichtenstein works like Wham! 1963 and Diptyke, or Diptych? I don't know. Dip Tyke. I guess it would be Tyke if there was an E at the end, right? Of an exploding plane that is in the collection of the Tate Modern in London and Blam, 1962. Another aerial combat image in the Yale University Art Gallery collection. Hmm. Okay. So join me, dear viewers, as I continue to read boringly the rest of this article. You won't you won't be disappointed. Both works made com considerable use of Heath images from an issue of the DC comic series All American Men of War, with Blam in particular retaining much of Heath's original look and detail. The art world, of course, has long debated whether Lichtenstein who died in 1997, and other artists who worked in this way were creating art or merely copying it. Uh, Greg, <coughs> Greg Land. <coughs> excuse me, excuse me. I had to clear my throat. Um, aficionados of comic book art who have always felt the work they love has not gotten the proper respect and especially defensive of Mr. Heath and others whose drawings were borrowed. <coughs> Greg Land! <coughs> Hold on, I need to get some more coffee. I mean, I've got something going on here. Ah, yep, that's good stuff. Good stuff. Admirers of Lichtenstein said he altered and elevated the source material to transform it into an artistic statement. Eh, I suppose I suppose that's not too unlike what we do with photographs today. 
uh, with Photoshop and all these other marketing and advertising materials. I mean, you could put a space background on somebody walking in the desert and uh, make it all black and white, except for maybe the guy, maybe the, his shirt is red or something, or her shirt, and that'd be the only color in the whole piece. That might be the same thing to elevate it, you know, alter and elevate it into an artistic statement. You never know. And the color red might be uh, used for, like, uh, you know, walk for cancer or run for cancer or, you know, you know. So, I mean, I can kind of understand that, that use of it. The art critic Tom Lubbock, 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 Tom Lubbock was one who thought Mr. Heath and others deserved more credit. Now, of course that's a given. I mean, the source artist, you know, the one who is drawing without the use of fakery and trickery and all that other stuff, of course, they deserve the credit. I mean, people used his actual drawings for reference materials. So, yeah... Give him the credit. The cartoon artists, though highly productive, were not naive. Anonymous hacks. He wrote in 2004, reviewing a Liechtenstein retrospective at the Harvard, I'm sorry, Hayward Gallery in London for The Independent. A lot of the innovations in Liechtenstein's pictures are innovations that they came up with first. They were responsible for adapting the convention of the cinematic close-up to the still image. They worked out the dynamic interaction of the image, caption, speech bubble, and sound effect. They devised those dramatic compositions from which Lichtenstein's work gets much of its impact. Now, I suppose if you're going to alter and elevate, as it, as it were, uh, design comes into play and maybe you can use uh, and I see it all the time because that's what I do for a living um, artists draw stuff and then y- you as a designer would would, ne- would essentially add to it with other content creating a expanded composition based on those elements I mean I understand that and it makes sense and you could actually derive greater impact from a combination of several different artistic sources um, in your final design but you still need to credit everybody involved you know what I mean um, it's, it's a slippery slope sometimes all right oh no more subscriptions these illustrators, it seems to me, should be co-credited alongside Liechtenstein. I agree 100%. Like I just said, everybody needs the credit. So back in the day when all this stuff was young, and not a lot of people got their credit, and this goes along the lines of the Superman stuff, Simon & Schuster, all that stuff that still continues. I'm 100% a firm believer behind creator-owned materials. I don't care what deal gets made or anything. I mean, I don't know of any creator who has any real throwaway material, you know, because you put so much of your heart and soul into something. And then just to say, hey, I don't care about the rights. I don't care about the credits at all. Um, Just do what you want. Just pay me my 25 cents an hour and, and we'll get on. I don't think that's, I think that's well beyond the conversation these days. I think most everybody, even the people who aren't even in the industry, when they're about to jump into the industry, they're looking for, hey, they're looking for all those bullet points that say, can I keep my rights? Yeah, that's like the number one thing for anybody walking in the door now. They're like, can I keep my rights on my stuff? I mean, I can draw your stuff or I can color your stuff or or whatever and write your stuff. If that's what the contract says, you're just going to pay me. But if I'm bringing something new to the table, 
I want to, can I keep my stuff, you know? And I think that's what today's creative industry, comic industry is about. And, you know, there's, I think I listened to a podcast recently with Mark Wade in there talking to, I think it, I forget the name of it. I'll try to link it in the show notes here, but, um, he said something like, um, <clears throat> what did he say? Ugh, coffee time. That's what he said. Coffee time. Every time is coffee time. I think Mark Wade said something along the lines of, <clears throat> that's it. Yep. I totally forgot. <laughs> I will, I will get back to that train of thought. It was important. I'm not a professional. <laughs> As you can tell, I'm not a, I'm not a, a radio professional who, who has my notes out in front of me and says, Hey, refer to your notes, jackass. All right. These illustrators should be co-credited. Uh... This right here, Invol- involuntary contributions. Um, I don't know. That means somebody stole your work with the paintings to which they made such divisive, though, involuntary contributions. So, yeah, so if, if Russ, he, look at this young shot of Russ right there. So if he did a drawing and... Lichtenstein just stole it outright and then created a, a larger composition on it that gained him wider notoriety, then yeah, that's thievery. You know? That's thievery. And that is an involuntary contribution. <clears throat> Look at that. Look at that artwork. Look at that. Back in the day. In his 80s, Wow. Mr. Heath created a six-panel comic that commented on Lichtenstein's borrowing and promoted the Hero Initiative, a fund that helps comic book artists in need and had assisted him with medical expenses. Hmm. I'd like to check that out, whatever that is. Is it, is it here? It is here. Um, so what I'll do is I'll add this link into the show notes whatever links I can into the show notes so you guys can look at it if you want. That comic included Mr. He's standard response to the debate over Lichtenstein's work, which was that he thought Lichtenstein at least owed him a drink. Hmm. Well, I'll be damned. At least give him a drink, you know, in the afterlife. The two of you in the afterlife right now, get up there to that bar in the sky and order a couple of drinks on the rocks and share it. All right. He made the point somewhat more bluntly to the Boston Globe in 2006 for an article that carried the headline, Lichtenstein, creator of copyright, I'm sorry, creator or copycat my coffee is is starting to kick in now, starting to work. He never even had me over for a cocktail. And then he died, he said. So I guess I'm out of luck. That bastard Lichtenstein. That bastard. Russell DeHart Heath Jr. was born in September 29, 1926 in Manhattan. His father was a cowboy in Arizona Wow, from 1917 to the 1920s and later became a chemical engineer. What? How do you go from being a cowboy to a chemical engineer? You're like, mm, yahoo, and you're smacking the horse with your, your, your lead or whatever. And then the very next day, you know, I think I'm going to go hang out in the barn and start putting together some various liquids I found (laughs) and see if I don't explode the barn 
I don't know. It's funny. You know, people's uh, jobs in life. Anyway, so he became a chemical engineer. His mother, Margaret Longnaker, his mo- Margaret Longnaker Heath was a homemaker. What? What? Longnaker homemaker? I bet you she got clowned a lot. No, I'm not trying to make fun. Um, young Russell grew up in Montclair, New Jersey. His attention to detail in his drawings may have come from his father, who, he said in a 2011 interview with the Montclair Times, used to take him to the movies. Westerns were their favorite, and his father's time as a cowboy made him an expert critic of the genre. Hmm. Okay. He would point at the screen, and there would be an actor with a flowery shirt on, Mr. Heath recalled. He would say... No cowboy in his right mind would wear that shirt. (laughs) You damn right. You damn right. Mr. Mr. Heath Sr. What is... uh, Yeah. I I don't recall your name. No more ads. GI Combat. Look at that. Look at that. That's like Tim Truman-esque. Well, maybe Tim Truman is Ross Heath-esque. You know? That's beautiful. Beautiful artwork. 1961. He graduated from Montclair High School, though he admitted he was somewhat was a somewhat inattentive student. <laughs> aren't we all or aren't we all today still in this day and age? I probably flunked out a lot of classes. Didn't we all? I couldn't wait for class to end so I could draw. Me too. I learned how to draw in math class. Yep. He enlisted in the Army Air Corps during World War II, his daughter said, and had just finished basic training and was awaiting deployment when the war ended. He had done some drawings for comics as a teenager, and after working briefly in advertising after the war, he turned to comic book art full-time. He worked for Timely Comics, a predecessor of Marvel, mostly on westerns like Two Gun Kid. As his career went along, he began drawing more and more war comics, including work on GI Combat for DC Comics. He also drew suspense, mystery, and romance comics, and even the occasional Batman story, though he said in a 2007 interview he wasn't very good at rendering the Cape Crusader. When I drew him, he looks like somebody standing there ready to go to a costume party, he said. Hmm. What's in your wallet? His work also included Plastic Sam, a Plastic Man parody. Oh man, how you gonna how you gonna parody Plastic Man? Wait. You've got Elongated Man. You've got Mr. Fantastic. You know, that's a video in itself. Who came first? For an early issue of Mad Magazine, he drew a raucous parody called Cowgirls at War. Uh Uh-oh. For the National Lampoon Encyclopedia of Humor in 1973. In the late 1970s, Mr. Heath moved to California and worked as a layout artist or designer on a number of animated series, including The Karate Kid and G.I. Joe. Oh, snap. And eventually, his comic book art gained more respect. A 2011 exhibition at the New York Historical Society called Out of Time, Designs for the 20th Century Future, included a black included a 1957 black ink drawing by Mr. Heath that was a parody of Sputnik Mania. It was a machine that looked like what a satellite in a 1950s car might produce if they mated. Are you sure that's not a transformer? Part Sputnik, part Edsel. It is a spherical flying machine with fins and antennas and a comically elaborated front bumper and grill. Ken Johnson wrote, 
in reviewing the show in the New York Times. This and other satiric images suggest that for every true believer, there was a skeptic ready to pounce on the goofy excesses of imagination to which visionaries are prone. Man, they really used to talk like that. I would be bored to death. I'm like, just get to the point, fool. You know, just get to the point. What are you trying to say? Mr. Heath's marriage to Joyce E. Rupp in 1947 ended in divorce. Oh, so I guess it E. Ruption. I guess it ruptured. There was an eruption of that marriage. Ha ha ha. That's not funny. In addition to Miss Herzl, he is survived by two other daughters. Arlene Heath Chides and Maureen Heath Coza. A son, Russell DeHart Heath III, six grandchildren and seven great-grandchildren. Late in life, Mr. Evanier said, Mr. Heath was sought after by aficionados. When he was in his 80s, Russ was commissioned by many of his fans to recreate his best covers of the past in drawings for them. Oh, that would have been dope. I, I would have liked to have had something like that. They all said they'd rather have that than one of Roy Lichtenstein's Heath knockoffs. Well said. Well, that's it. That's it. So, that's going to be my latest entry for... Uh, these comic book legends gone but not forgotten alright so I will see you guys in the next video peace out and I hope everyone out there is having a great Friday and whatever art projects you're working on I hope you're, you're reaching your goals and y'all are doing well Peace out. And Thanks for watching Creator Legends. Please subscribe, like, and share. Links and details for this artist are in the show notes. See you next time.